The Unshackled Waves, episode 217. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Back in October, the ABC's Radio National program, Background Briefing, did an expose on members of the Nationalist Lad Society in Sydney who had joined the New South Wales Young Nationals. This program coincided with a doxing dump by a new Antifa group, the White Rose Society, who wrote extensive profiles on senior members of the lads involved in the National Party, which included many social media screenshots. The ABC mentioned the Unshackled during the program when they played my interview with Blair Cottrell and referred to us as an alt-right website, whatever that means. More recently, the White Rose Society has attacked myself and our editor-at-large Steel Archer as fascists without providing any proof we hold such views. Clearly, they have become quite cocky following their initial mainstream media attention that they feel that they can smear anyone they like. These exposés resulted in the New South Wales National Party launching an investigation of 35 members' ties to alleged neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. 19 of those members resigned, citing trial by media and that the major parties had rejected nationalist ideas over the past 50 years. The National Party handed out 22 life bans and banned its party members from being part of the Lad Society and similar nationalist organisations such as the New Guard and Squadron 88. The mainstream media has commended the National Party for expelling these evil neo-Nazis and white supremacists, but what is the real story and what is it like being branded with the extreme right or far right label or whatever other term that the media wants to use? Well, my guest today will tell his side of the story. Thomas Brasher was one of the Lad Society members doxxed by the White Rose Society. His previous social media accounts were quite active, promoting his nationalist views at their backup, which is great to see. He, this is his first media appearance since his doxing, so there is certainly a lot to ask him. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, I want to start where all this uh, started, the, the Lad Society that you're a member of in, in Sydney. Now, it yep. seemed to be a Melbourne orientated organisation. Its founder and leader, Tom Sewell, is based there along with high profile member Blair Cottrell. But you have a clubhouse there in Sydney. What type of culture does Lad Sydney have? It's very community orientated. Despite the look it sometimes gives of being political, it really isn't. Like, we catch up there. We have um, sometimes there's, like, fight nights. Like, we have uh, boxing for anybody that wants to do boxing. Uh, besides that, we sometimes get up to uh, other activities, debates, and uh, the like. So it's actually a great way to uh, network as well and make friends. Uh, and it really helps with employment because I've met quite a few people now that can get me jobs everywhere. So it's really helpful in a lot of ways, you know. Yeah, that's definitely what you need. Mm. And as you mentioned, LAD sees itself as a community organisation. A lot of people in a, do see political activism as a step forward, and that's uh, what you LADs in Sydney decided to do by joining the, the New South Wales Young Nationals en masse. I actually joined the Young Nationals because one of my good friends, Oscar from the LAD Society, had joined. And I asked him why he did, and he said that he wanted to... Uh, to help the party and, and help rural Australians. And he, he also believes that you know, a vital part of helping rural Australians is actually fixing the immigration problem we have at the moment because it's screwing over farmers almost the most. And, uh, you know, I, I heard this and I decided to jump on board. You know, all through high school, I uh, grew up in the countryside, so I am rural orientated and I thought it would be a good step forward to uh, join the party as well. Now, when you first, uh, all of you, got into the spotlight it was at the the new south wales young nationals agm in may and clifford jennings who's one of the the leaders at lad society sydney put forward a couple of motions one to accept migrants from culturally compatible countries and to accept white south african farmers as refugees now this triggered a couple of new south wales young nats uh, ethan gordon and jessica price uh, pronell who 
really kickstarted this chain of events. Do you think, given that you were new members of the party, was it a mistake to to go in with these motions right at the the beginning, given that they did prick the interests of these senior people and these sort of young progressives who, well, they're trying to take over the party as well? Well, listen, you know, like politics is all about taking bold action. You know, you enter into things boldly. If we had entered with our immigration concerns and we just palmed these off because we were afraid of being criticized, when would we introduce them? I mean, the party is the party. The culture within it isn't going to change if we're there for a little longer. And furthermore, we didn't know how progressive the party was. When we entered the party, we thought it was a, a center, center-right party. The impression that I got from the Young Nationals is that, that they're far from centre-right. When Clifford had pushed that immigration motion and when I had voted on it, uh, we thought it would probably would have gotten support. But yeah, it was, it, it was uh, turned out real bad. <laughs> yeah, so as you said, you're actually surprised that the, the National Party weren't receptive to these type of motions. Yeah basically. And like, it was really funny, you know, there were a couple of um, colored people, like there was an Indian immigrant that had come to Australia, he's part of the Young Nationals, and he supported us, you know, there were a couple of people who weren't white, that were even agreed with us. But we had this faction in the party, that were quite obviously very, very progressive, the way some of these people talked in the debates, it sounded as if they were from the Greens party. And it was it was shocking. And I, I find it quite funny, because following this, you know, uh, Dozens of media outlets uh, called it an infiltration. Yeah, branch stack, that's what they called yeah. it. These strangers had turned up to the AGM and started putting these, these far-right motions, as they called it. But look, I would like to see what would happen if a group of people joined and they wanted progressive policies in. They wanted the gay marriage, they wanted to up the immigration take. Do you think the media would have absolutely freaked out and said they were infiltrating? Or would they have just said these are progressive people? You know, there is there is a complete double standard. There is no doubt that the Young Nationals Party has been absolutely infiltrated from far leftists. If you look at the Young Nats Constitution, you can go on their website and read about their constitution. It's very right wing. They talk about the the importance of the family unit, how it's the foundation of society. They talk about upholding the freedom of association, and they complete backtracked this because they found out I was in light society they said explain yourself and I'm thinking hold on your own constitution is going against you freedom of association how does this make sense you know I think it's very funny as I said before that they said we infiltrated because uh, actually following the conference we had a party it was a party with all the young nationals people and following the night some people got some people got drunk and uh, this this very drunk girl walked up to me I won't name her she started yelling at me and saying, oh, do you support Trump? Why do you support Trump? And I, I was saying, yeah, I support Trump. Well, what's wrong with that? And she goes, why? And I said, well, I, I, think he, I think he's working in my people's interests. And she goes, well, that's not an argument. I said, well, yeah, it is. You know, politics is about collective power and it's about who has power over who. And I was telling her, and she goes, well, well why else? And I said, well, he believes in the, the sacredness of uh, private property. And then she tells me, well, I don't believe in private property. It's not real. And I was shaking my head. This girl is in the Young Nationals. In their constitution, it talks Yikes. about the farmer's right to own property. And this woman doesn't believe in property, yet we're infiltrating. Yeah, that's that, that's scary. Heaven help yeah. the future of the National Party. It is. It is. There are some Marxists in there, I think. There's some Marxists in all of our institutions. They've, they've done the walk through, through the institutions. I will say that the left wing are much, much better at subverting and ruling than the right wing are. We're losing the game. Conservatives are just losing and losing. Well, it's good you haven't lost your fire either. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> now, these uh, progressives in the, the New South Wales Young Nationals, they, as I mentioned, were, were triggered into digging around to see who you and Clifford and the others were what organizations you're associated with and this is when the the first news article uh, popped up about you all joining the the young nationals that was andrew clonelg in the australian the headline was fears of a alt-right takeover in the young nationals are ripe and it mentioned uh, clifford jennings history of founding alt-right australia and being a producer of the the dingoes podcast was there any other media attention at this time were you beginning to sort of feel that there was a level of scrutiny coming your way 
Yeah, look, we laughed about it. I, I personally didn't think much of it. I just thought it would have blown over, but it, it didn't. <laughs> yeah. Because there was a five-month gap between this uh, media story and the Australian and the, the ABC and the, the White Rose Society uh, right. doxing. Do you, yeah. Did you and the, the lads put any strategies in place to avoid infiltration into lads or any of the other nationalist groups that are on social media, which we saw in the end, were part of this investigation that was put together by ABC and White Rose Society? The primary doxing from the White Rose Society centered around a Facebook group called the New Guard, okay? And this was apparently a, um, like a pseudo-fascist movement uh, created on Facebook. It's, just an, it's another online, you know, group. There's so many of them. I was never a part of it. Uh, I never joined it. And I have no idea of how they vetted their members. I don't know their, I didn't know their organizational plans. So I can't really comment on how they avoided infiltration into the Young Guard. Furthermore, with Lad Society, as I said, I'm not one of the head leaders of the Lad Society. I'm not like a, an organizational person in it. I'm just a member. However, we do have some basic vetting procedures. We, um, we don't meet people at the headquarters. We meet them at other places. We suss them out. We ask them, you know, what do they think of this and that to see, you know, what their motivations may be. But uh, other than that, that's all I know of. Now, you continued with your public activism. You had a Twitter and a Instagram account that was quite active. You spoke uh, very well, in, in my opinion, at the first ever True Blue Crew New South Wales Aussie Pride flag march and also spoke at a Free Tommy rally in Sydney and did several vlogs. So you still wanted to, to make sure you were putting your views out there and you weren't deterred by this scrutiny that was come your way? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't really care less about uh, what the media thought of me or what the Young Nationals thought of me. You know, I thought, you know, coming into this Young Nationals game, I had this naive, very young brain of actually believing that dem democracy was legitimate and that you could enter a party and speak your views. <laughs> uh, subsequently, I found out that um, my world isn't so bright and full of rainbows as I thought it was. And uh, I've seen some very dirty tricks pulled. My uh, home address has been released following the Young Nationals fiasco. I'm not making accusations of who released my address, but I do think it's very fishy. Uh, I've received threats. I've received everything uh, of the sort. Uh, so there's been some very foul play. Oh, well, yeah, you're 19. You're obviously young and idealistic. I've been in the political game oh, much longer, and I know whenever you try to step up in the political scene, then there's people who want to get you, and because you, were, you all joined a political party, then, in their opinion, you are fair game. Now, the, the first, obviously, the first uh, indication you got that this doxing was happening was the ABC reporter Alex Mann went to your Sydney clubhouse yeah. and, and you closed the, the roller door on him. Was, was that the, the right thing to do, in, in your opinion? L listen, looking back on it, I think we could have played the game differently. Looking back on it, I think it would have been better to perhaps go outside and have a very reasonable discussion with him about it. But uh, listen, that's not what we did. Alex Mann showed up unsolicited. He did not let any of us know. He just showed up at our door and said, I'm the ABC. Like that, that, that will freak out a normal person. Like if you show up to a person's house and say, I'm the ABC, most people are going to go like, you know, it's because it's like, it, it came from nowhere. You didn't expect it. If Alex Mann had sent us an email and said, listen, I'm interested in uh, approaching the headquarters and talking to you and uh, having a formal interview, we would have been better prepared, but he just showed up out of nowhere. And, you know, we just, it was the spur of the moment. Yeah, he probably wanted to, to come in unannounced because he was hoping for some type of reaction. Did he come with, with anyone else? Uh, was, was it just him and the camera crew or did he come with others? Uh, I think he was with about three people. I think there were about two camera crew. Now, the White Rose Society, they seem to do most of the, the heavy lifting in this doxing because the, mm. the, the ABC background briefing uh, report, that mainly focused on the, the alt-right in Australia uh, as a whole. Why the, the White Rose Society, they knew your real name, they knew where you lived, uh, where you worked, where you went to school, uh, went to uni, 
they they probably knew you better than a lot of us know you so yeah. how, how, yeah. how does how disturbing was that that they just knew that level of detail about your life and the fact that i was just going through it today the the white rose society thing for for research and it goes for like if you printed it out it'd probably be about 20 pages full of yeah, information like about yeah it's a kindle I, you know like when i read it I, I was just like wow um this is some a grade level stalking you know she listed where i went to high school where i lived during my teenage years she wrote which suburb i live in she knows where i live she posted my names uh she posted uh who i live near as well my family members this woman uh kaz ross she associates with the white rose i'm not allegating that she wrote the article but she is one of the ringleaders in the white rose society and uh this woman works in the tasmanian university and it was quite ironic because following the doxes a couple of weeks later Kaz Ross went on, an, on, on a radio show and she was talking about, oh, I'm receiving death threats in my mailbox because apparently some right wingers in Tasmania weren't happy with her and w were messing with her. And it was quite funny because she said um, on, the, on the radio interview, she said, you know, I think this is quite sad. I was just an academic doing my job. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's, oh, you're just a harmless academic posting my suburb of where I live online for everybody to see posting where i grew up just harmless harmless fun you know? yeah i mean she basically tried to ruin a lot of young men's lives i mean that is the the goal of these people i mean they yeah. say that they're noble anti-fascist crusaders yeah. and and doing their 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 duty to to the cause but mm -hmm. the idea is to basically disrupt your life and make you feel unsafe that you'll basically hide away and not do any further activism right yeah that that's the goal of them right like but they just bully uh young people into submission uh they recently did it uh, i saw a white rose article on facebook or something about this other kid i think like a 20 year old from the liberal yeah. party apparently he, he did a, a heil hitler at a party when he was very drunk and she's gone on this long tirade about how he's a fascist because of this you know this woman like enjoys to ruin young people's lives I saw yeah. that article myself, the, the the newest one, and they mentioned a whole bunch of other people who they hadn't mentioned before and called them fascist and Nazis, and they actually didn't have any so-called evidence to, to back it up. They just labeled them as such. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just, it's just slander, right? It's just character assassinations, doing it from behind the screen of an anonymous blogger. Very brave stuff, very brave, very anti-fascist. Now, the New South Wales Young Nationals, they suspended the, the two office bearers who were associated with you, Clifford Jennings and, and Lisa Sanford, and then the New South Wales National Party launched an investigation into infiltration by neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And then there was a follow-up article by Sherry Markson in the, the Daily Telegraph, who well, is Jewish herself, so she has, I, I suppose, a bit of an interest in this. The headline was neo-Nazis and said that 35 members are under investigation for their ties to such groups and and that was sort of can you describe your treatment at the hands of the the national party i mean what what were they asking you personally they sent me like one or two emails asking me to this is from memory but i think they, they sent me an email asking me to explain why i was involved with the lad society they said we we want an explanation why are you involved with these people and apparently they sent that out to a lot of other people as well. And after that uh, Daily Telegraph article was published, the, the next day, Clifford Jennings and 18 others of you who are under investigation resigned. And in well, Clifford's resignation letter talked about how he cited trial by media and the fact that you know young white men and nationalists have been uh, betrayed by the, the major parties. After the, the resignations were, were handed in, you would have felt quite beaten down by the political process. As you mentioned, you're young and idealistic, and yet you've basically been shunned from all major political parties forever they say there's no place for people like you yeah i'm, I'm, I'm actually officially banned from ever joining the nationals party yeah because yeah. they banned any national party member from being a member of the lad society the new guard and another organization squadron 88 right my only crime 
personally was being a part of the Lad Society. I was never part of Squadron 88. I was never part of the New Guard. I was never part of any of these groups. My only crime was being part of a nationalist community. Now, how did the Sydney lads themselves respond to this increased detention? It wasn't just you who was doxxed, it was other members had extensive profiles written about them, personal <laughs> information. Was there much internal tension or, or blaming? How did you respond as a, as a group? Uh, we actually dealt with it quite well, and I think we came out of it very, very strong. I think that, you know, Look, we all knew this was going to happen eventually, right? Like, uh, nationalists are enemies of the state in the West. And so we knew that Lad Society would eventually be attacked if we were to become a bigger, stronger group, which we are becoming. So, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't out of the blue. We knew it was going to happen eventually. And out of this, we've become a lot stronger. And we also know who the most loyal members are. Because a lot of these people that joined the Lad Society, that said, you know, they're dedicated and love their country, they've, they've run away like fleas. At, at one site of a, of a media coverage. So it's quite telling in trials of hardship who the real loyal members are. So I think it's a good thing what's happened. So it was like a cleansing in a way. Yeah. And how did your friends and your university respond to you being branded a Nazi? Because that's a, it's, it's a pretty uh, hardcore label to, to put on somebody. University, um, I've been harassed by the socialist alternative there. I won't name names, but there's a very prominent girl in the University of Wollongong who's always around the socialist stance, and she yells at me now and calls me a fascist and a Nazi, and, you know, all I can do is really lift the middle finger, because if I complain about this, if I complain to the university, make a big stink, I have a feeling the odds aren't going to be in my favour. Well, they call everyone a fascist and a Nazi these days, so in that sense, you're not really that special to be called that by yeah. a, a socialist at a university campus. Yeah. How would you describe your views? Obviously, you're a, you're a nationalist. In uh, previous live stream appearances, you've, you've expressed that there needs to be more care for the, the white people of Australia. How exactly would you define your political philosophy? My political philosophy is old style Australian nationalism. I believe in true diversity, which means that communities uh, remain intact. They, they keep their cultural identity. They keep their ethnicity intact. You know, like I believe that nationalism is, is a much stronger spiritual, cultural and political uh, ideology than, than globalism. Globalism, the end result of globalism is a whole world with no country that people can call their own. It's a, it's a melting pot across the world where there's no diverse uh, ranges of culture. There's no diverse ethnicities. There's one people, one mixed up culture, if you could call it a culture, and a government ruling over them. And to me, that seems like a, a serious, serious dystopia. And if we keep heading down the way Australia is, we will become part of this uh, one world government. It's happening. I believe that every country should retain their cultural and ethnic identity. You know, I think Japanese, Japan should remain Japanese and, and so on. I don't want to see those countries overridden by everybody else in the world. Uh, but saying that, I also, I also have to make it clear that with, with Australia and with the immigrants here that have you know, been here for quite a while that aren't from uh, Europe, well, Dia is a good example, she's, uh, she's assimilated quite well. And these people should be treated you know, as Australian citizens. So you don't have to take my, my care of uh, retaining my own ethnicity as an attack on others, if that makes sense. Yes, I saw your live stream with uh, Dia Beltran, and in that live stream, you did discuss the, the Holocaust, where you questioned the 